morning, everybody. Please continue to uh, enjoy your breakfast, but in the interest of time, we will get started. Uh, my name is Tim Sink. I'm president of the Greater Concord Chamber of Commerce, and I uh, want to welcome you here for what I think is going to be a, a really terrific uh, forum of uh, talk this morning. Uh, a couple of announcements just to start off. Um, I want to thank our sponsor, Unitil, who generously is supporting this event. Um, Gary Miller and Tom Palmer are here uh, representing Unitil. We can't do these types of programs without the support of organizations like Unitil, so please help me uh, show our appreciation to that. <laughs> also want to recognize a few elected officials with our, that are here with us. We have uh, two city councilors, Stacy Brown and Byron Champlin, so thank you Stacy and Byron for joining us this morning. And a uh, great support of our chamber board. So with us this morning from the board, Alyssa Alfieri, Larry Haynes, Scott Lappinghouse, Brenda Litchfield, Dara Madden, uh, Gary Miller, Jim Samoes, and, and also Byron Champlin. So thank you board members for, uh, for being here and being very present, we appreciate that. <laughs> We've got a ton of upcoming events, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna narrow it down to two, some things that are very present. One of them is the chamber's annual meeting. That is taking place November 1st at the Grapponi Conference Center, uh, five o'clock. We will be honoring uh, Mayor Jim Boulay as our Citizen of the Year. So I, I hope you can join us for that. There is still some time to get a, a seat at that event, but uh, we are filling that up, so please join us. Uh, the second thing I want to mention is that we have been partnering with New Hampshire Sangha and others to put together a conference on uh, Immigrants in the Workforce, essentially. The, the title of the conference is Moving Together Conversations. It will be a combination of um, uh, businesses and people entering the workforce and people who, have, uh, who will be sharing their experiences in the workforce. We have a, a series of terrific speech, uh, speakers that are gonna be part of this event. Uh, James McKim is here with us. He's one of our outstanding speakers. Thank you, James. Appreciate having you here. Uh, so please join us at that event. That is taking place on November the 15th from 9 to 4 p.m. at the Grapponi Conference Center. All right, so um, now I have the honor of introducing our speaker. And before I do, I just want to remind folks, this book is very much hot off the press. This is what we're going to be discussing this morning. And if you'd like to purchase a copy of it, you can do so in the back of the room, or you can just let us know um, another time, and we will put one aside for you. Jeff Fuhrer is a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution and a foundation fellow at Eastern Bank Foundation. He was previously executive vice president and director of research at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston where he was also responsible for the bank's diversity and inclusion uh, functions. Currently, he is a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institute and foundation fellow at Eastern Bank Foundation. Some of his former positions include senior fellow uh, Masavar Romani, did I pronounce that correctly, Jeff? Not even close. As far as I know. Sorry. Uh, Center for Business and Government, Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Um, he was Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer for Mass Development. He was Executive Vice President and Senior Policy Advisor for the Re uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, and Executive Vice President and Director of Research at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Um, he has his PhD and MA at Harvard University also his BA in economics uh, at Princeton University. We got to know Jeff some years ago when he was with the Federal Reserve Bank. He came up and gave us uh, a talk on the economic outlook and um, he was, it just was terrific and he was kind enough to come back um, afterwards a few times and so we're so delighted to have him here to talk about his new book, The Myth That Made Us. So please welcome Jeff Ewell. Thank you. It's great to be back here this morning, um, and it, the room is familiar, the faces are familiar, Tim, Tim of course is familiar, Gary, I mean, I have some friends now in this room, which is terrific. So uh, it's, it's, I'm so happy to be here. I, people ask how I got involved in this project, um, and I don't want to make this much about me at all, honestly, except that we're all on a journey together to understand how it is that our economy got to be the way it is, how it meets out success to some and denies it to others. Um, that is no more true than it is uh, with respect to racial and, and ethnic differences in the country. Very different outcomes. We need to come to, I think, a, a reckoning as to how we got here, 
an important message of the book is that it was not by accident. We made a bunch of choices over our history that shaped the economy across racial, ethnic, gender um, categories in, in a way that made some large corporations and some wealthy individuals <laughs> very, very well off. They're doing great, thank you very much. That is not by accident. We chose to structure the economy that way because part of the way that those wealthy individuals and the largest corporations are successful is that they are not paying many of their workers, not the folks in the C-suite, they're not paying many of their workers enough to survive without access to government benefits. Now, I'm not arguing against government benefits. I'm saying, thank God they're there because literally a bunch of families would die if they didn't have them. But the notion that those very successful corporations and some wealthy folks, um, but particularly the corporations, can send their workers home at night knowing that they don't have enough to survive without getting food stamps is to me unconscionable. And people say, well, it's a tough free capitalist, you know, free market capitalist society. It's just tough out there. It's like, it doesn't seem to be tough for the folks sitting in the C-suite. And most importantly, <clears throat> the level of profits earned at those very large corporations today is at record-breaking levels. So it's not tough for them. They're making incredible profits. In fact, so large, we talked about this briefly at the table, the profits are so large that in the tax year 2022, total profits am amounted to $2.6 trillion, of which over a trillion dollars was used to repurchase companies' shares to prop up their own stock prices. How can you say it's a tough world when you have a trillion dollars left over just to prop your stock prices up higher than they would have been otherwise while you're not paying all of your employees enough to survive in this economy? <coughs> We structured something rather perverse. I mean, it's successful in some ways, of course. We're in many ways the leading economy in the world. Um, in the aggregate, there's loads of income generated each year, and there's a lot of wealth. It's just held by a very few few people. So why did I get into this? For those reasons. You know, over time, this took me time to figure out, and I'm not done learning about lots of things. But when I understood that we had consciously, since our inception, denied opportunity, first to indigenous people, then to black African slaves, then to some European groups who ultimately generally did okay, then to Hispanics, then to some Asian subpopulations, and to a bunch of poor white families. When I realized that we had designed the economy to work in that way, I said that I, along with some other people now, fortunately, we need to write about this. We need to elevate these issues because they are existential for the, for the country. They're first order in the way that I believe climate change is as well. You know, if, if we don't do something about climate change, it's going to be not a, a fun place to live. But similarly, if we don't do something about the dramatic lack of opportunity in the country, um, it, it's going to cause us problems. Certainly, it will cause the problem that tens of millions of families are not succeeding and not their members not achieving the potential that they have, either economic or human. And so for both of those reasons, economic and human, we need to address this. This is not about other, this is about us, and we all together are not doing as well as we could. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> so that's the preamble to the book. And it's serious, you know, I'm used to getting up and talking about the economy when we're in good times and having fun with, with you guys, right? I mean, you, you folks. Um, this one is less fun. In the end, I want to say some optimistic things, but optimistic, not easy optimistic, but with, with some hard work on all of our parts, optimistic. So this is kind of what I, I said. This is just a little doodly thing. You can read it. It's saying what I just said. Why is it that all those folks go home with not enough to survive, and there's two stories that explain that. One is it's their fault, which is very common. We'll see in a second. <clears throat> the other is that, no, they didn't start off with opportunity, access, family resources, and so on. Do those stories matter? This is a book in large part about stories that we tell, and in some cases, stories are just fun. These stories matter because they've been used by people who have economic and political power to continue reinforcing the structures that deliver great outcomes to the corporations and wealthy individuals I just referenced, and not so much to other folks. 
And we're complicit in that, in that I, it's surprising to me how many folks still believe some of the narratives I'll tell you about in a second. So what are those narratives? They're, I want to emphasize, these are false narratives, but they're nonetheless stories that people tell all the time and hold on to quite tightly. One is the, the bootstraps narrative, the meritocracy narrative, the Horatio Alger narrative, all the same kind of thing. That you just, if you just work hard and put your nose to the grindstone, you're going to succeed in this economy, so dream big and do it. That's a great aspiration. I tell my kids to work hard, I, I always did. And I would tell other people that you're not getting very far without hard work, but how far you can get for many circumstances is dismaying. Um, this is just to say that that's actually not what Horatio Alger was about. <laughs> this is a foreword to one of his most, uh, his biggest selling book, where he says, I'm not talking about getting people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. I'm trying to draw attention to the many, many poor kids in the US in the late 19th century and their plight, and then the, to, uh, try to jo have you join me in the work that these organizations are doing to help those kids. That's what his mission was. We've distorted even Horatio Alger's, Horatio, Horatio had other problems, not getting into it, but we've distorted Horatio Alger's message to suit our own narrative, right? So that's, a, that's kind of funny. An important corollary of that narrative is that if you think that hard work is all you need to succeed, then you can impute to anyone who hasn't succeed that they have not worked hard enough that they're lazy, and a, a related corollary is that we have a long history in this country, going back really to, the, really to the founding of the country, and it has its roots in European history before that, of mistrusting the poor. Why do we do that? There are other, perhaps we don't know them, but importantly, we think that, look at me, I'm a tall white guy, and I'm pretty successful. I worked hard, why don't they? Their success, their lack of success must be their fault. That's the way the narrative goes. Boy, is that wrong. Boy, is that first order wrong. Any of you who have any contact with people of lower income know that they are incredibly hardworking. They are disciplined. They know how to budget resources because they have to. You know what? My budget isn't that critical because I have extra money. I actually have more money now than I need to survive so I can do other stuff. Isn't that nice? Those, those are folks who need to budget carefully. And I'll give you an example of a person I interviewed who told that story powerfully. Many, most of them did. Second part of the false narrative suite that makes up the myth. We are a post-racist nation. That is a narrative, right? It's all behind us. Many people now are, are pushing to not even acknowledge what we have done and continue to do. But among those who acknowledge it, there's a, there are some who say, sure, that happened. It has no bearing on what's going on today. Well, that is demonstrably false as well. Businesses, it's not all about government. It's not all about just individual behavior e either. Businesses have been a part of the structuring of our economy. There is a narrative that is incredibly powerful especially among large corporations. I, I want to be careful to distinguish between large and small business. Small businesses have very different challenges. Large corporations are different things. So here I'm talking about the large ones. Milton Friedman in 1970 said, what business's job is, is to maximize shareholder value, full stop. And he said, they're paying attention to any of these other sort of social or societal or environmental issues is tantamount to socialism, says Milton Friedman. Now, Milton Friedman's not a dumb guy, was, was not a dumb guy. I actually met him a few times. They, he won the Nobel Prize in economics. Of course, he's smart. But that very narrow view of what businesses should do has been incredibly destructive because they've done it really well. The best way to satisfy your shareholders is maximize your profits. Keep your profits as high as possible. What's the best way to do that? Keep your costs low. What's the best way to do that? Well, the majority of costs are the, the costs that you incur in compensating your laborers, your laborers, your workers. Um, and as a consequence, they have kept wages low, benefits as skinny as possible. In many cases, they've outsourced jobs so they're no longer really part of the corporation, don't have the opportunity to move up. They have made their schedules less predictable. Now, so for people who have a family or any other commitment that's not part of their job, an unpredictable work, work schedule is incredibly disruptive. And most importantly, they have reduced the, I'll call it the voice that workers have, or maybe even more importantly, the counterbalancing p 
power that the workforce might have versus the employers. It's not that they should, that the workers, you know, should dictate what goes on in the workforce, but there needs to be some counterbalancing voice. Otherwise, you get what we have today, <laughs> which is workers don't have voice, they don't have power. This is why you're seeing more people talking about unionizing. That, that number of people unionizing is a tiny drop in the bucket. It's a tiny drop in the bucket. It's interesting to see, and I think it signifies how desperate some, some workforces are. But that narrative is a, is a huge deal. Jack Welch, an expert in practicing and implementing that narrative, boy, that, I'm sorry, but I don't think he's a very nice man. <laughs> Uh, what he did to the workforces in the company that he ran is kind of embarrassing. And finally, the government's role in this narrative is to just stay out of the way. Because after all, and I put this in quotes on purpose, free markets have to be allowed to operate because that's how we get an efficient, well-running economy. The reason I put it in quotes is because there's no such thing as a free market. Every market in this country and around the world, with a very few small exceptions of tiny agricultural markets in undeveloped countries, right, where people just get together and exchange goods without using money. But every market in this country and around the world is designed with particular features that deliver winners and losers. That's the way markets work. So what people say when they're saying the, the government should not interfere because we need markets to be free, what they mean is we really like the way markets are working for us right now without regard for what those markets are doing to other folks. This sounds like a political talk. It's not. There's actually very little in, in the way of politics in the book. It's not my mission. My mission is about facts, history, I hope clear-headed analysis, and then making recommendations to move forward. I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on these data charts, but this one, these charts just show you two things quickly. On the left, lots of people in the United States believe in the myth that all you need to do is work hard. Lots. It's actually true across Republicans and Democrats. Interestingly, there's not really much difference between white respondents and people of color. That's not on the chart, but trust me, that's the fact. And then on the right, it's just the case that the U.S. is special in this sense compared to other developed capitalist economies around the world in believing, and this is sort of the opposite point, that the reason that people uh, are in need on the right-hand side uh, is because of laziness or lack of willpower. The U.S., we believe that. Other countries. 15, 20 percent of the people would say that. The rest say, no, they, they were unfortunate. They didn't have good starting conditions, if you will. So this is just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go through this quickly because I don't want to leave time for some questions, but this is just what the counter narrative is, which is, no, of course, individual effort's not sufficient, although we would like to make it that way, of course. We'd like to make it much more that way. That's our goal and aspiration. We are not post-racist. The data are clear on that. So, of course, is the history. If you've read any of the history, the books that describe the history of our tortured racial history, you know uh, we can't be called post-racist. The effects uh, of, of all of the discrimination that was perpetuated up until today um, are, are still with us. We talked about maximizing profits. There are no free markets. The question is how we design them. And finally, I think this one's important. It's very squishy for an economist to talk about, but it's a kind of a uh, social norm, which is that we are really good at saying they and us. And one of the points of the book is there is no they. There is no they. Do you really believe that a kid, white, uh, black, brown kid, whatever it is, who, who is born in Mississippi, one of the poorest states in the country, doesn't matter? Do you believe that? Do you believe that that is not a us? Do you believe that's a them? You don't. I know you don't. <laughs> Every one of the kids born in this country should have a chance to succeed, but the data show really clearly that they just don't. Early childhood experiences and resources have a, an incredibly strong effect on what your adult success is going to look like. Will hard work make a difference? Yes, it will, but not enough. Um, there's tremendous research that follows individuals from the neighborhoods they were born in under the circumstances of low or median or high income, their race, their ethnicity, and their gender. And it turns out that down to the street level, basically, where you were born, which of course means what were your family resources and what was your school system like and what was public safety like, those things at birth are tremendous predictors at the age of 35 of how successful you'll be. Well, that shouldn't be right if we're really a country that is a land of opportunity where all I have to do is work hard, but it is true. So those initial conditions matter and we should not be comfortable with us when us grow up 
in places where you're not going to have a chance to succeed. And that is true of disproportionately for families of color, but it's true for a bunch of white families and white kids as well. There's, I'm, I don't mean to ignore that, neither do I mean to ignore the, the racial and ethnic history. Um, obviously, that's an additional overlay of, of uh, disadvantage. But there are a bunch of poor folks in, in the U.S. who are born under circumstances that will make it very difficult for them to succeed, a bunch of poor white folks. Um, we, need to, we should care about all of them. There's no they, there's only us. And as I said, we chose all this. So this is one statistic. Um, people have asked me, why did you get involved? <laughs> How did you get involved in this work? Why did you? Th so there's a host of reasons, starting from when I was a kid, including the privilege of working with um, folks who are different from me in all sorts of ways, and mentoring um, throughout my career dozens and dozens and dozens of people who were not mostly white males. They were female and most often people of color who were trying to understand how to make their way through the crazy workforce. But through that process, and then through looking at this kind of data, um, I said I have to write this book. Whether anybody reads it or not, I really need to write it, but I sure hope people read it. So here's the statistic. You know, most of you know, have heard of the poverty level or the poverty rate, right? You've heard of this, right? Because we, it went down a little bit during the pandemic because we extended some benefits to keep people whole during the crisis. It went up again at the beginning of this year because those some of those programs expired. Forget the poverty rate. Do you know what the poverty level is for a family of uh, two adults and two children in the United States as of today? So they consider you're you're. In, you're below the poverty line if you're making less than $30,000 in annual income for a family of four. That's not sustainable for anybody. And I don't mean it's not sustainable if you live in Boston or San Francisco or New York. Of course, it's not even close. But with this data, which I pulled together um, using some other data compiled by the Economic Policy Institute in DC, it says, what is a reasonable baseline, no frills, family budget look like for every county in the United States. So it's compiled for every county. And that, ba I mean, basic things, food, housing, the transportation you need to get to work and so on, some minimal level health care. that's it. Not vacations, not extra purchases of big screen TVs, forget all that. It's just the basic necessities. What does that cost? And the answer is there's no place in the country that a family of four can live for less than about $59,000 per year. So that's the cheapest counties in the US. Um, you might think that's, oh, that, that must be too high. Well, so I cross-checked this by looking at uh, what apartment rentals for a two-bedroom apartment for a family of four, let's say, look like in some of the cheapest neighborhoods in the country. And it's exactly what shows up in these statistics as part of the budget. There's no, nothing inflated here. Food costs what it costs, housing costs what it costs, transportation costs, you know, you just can't get around it. So with this, what this chart shows is, is shocking to me, which is that 57% of all families in the US do not have resources enough to pay for those basic necessities as determined by the budgets I just described. And when I say they don't have enough resources for the lower income folks, that includes whatever benefits they get from the US, the state, and the local governments. So that's all the resources they have at their disposal. They do not have enough income to meet basic necessities. So matched by family, by county, by the cost in that county, all around, add them up, 57%. And if you live in a household where the head of household is a black individual or a Hispanic individual, it's more like, it's above two thirds of all families. Okay, so you know, I'm not, I don't mean to speak for everyone in this room. I will speak for many of the people who live in my neighborhood. We are not in that group. We have enough resources to pay for what we need. But the fact that more than half of the families in the country don't is bizarre to me. This country in the aggregate is incredibly affluent and wealthy. That's the number of folks who are not going to make it without having to borrow a bunch, which doesn't put you in good shape down the road. Or if they're lucky, maybe some of them have family members who can, you know, extended family members who can contribute. But frankly, the data on that and then the interviews I conducted show that usually the, any family that has some income uh, has a net outflow of resources to the, re the rest of their family, not an inflow. They are supporting other folks in their extended family. So that's the statistic that me just says, what is going on? What is going on? Why should all those families be up at night worrying about paying for basic bills because they don't have enough? We created that, so that's an embarrassment. 
This is the person I was going to quote who makes less than $1,000 a month, has three children. She does get assistance for fuel and for rent because, of course, she'd be dead otherwise, uh, and her family. So she gets that assistance, but this is her story. She just says, I am constantly juggling bills day to day. C can I pay the rent this month or it's January and I need to pay the heat bill or we're going to freeze? What do I do? That's typical. And just one more thing about this story, because you're saying storytelling is so important. I can't remember who was telling you. It's about stories. Thank you, Gary. Um, the story of this, this lady is that even though she's struggling just to make ends meet, she donates time to her community to volunteer for the diaper bank and the voter registration group. So she's hardworking, very, and she's giving back to her community. Wow, okay, and that's actually, tip. This, that's a good description. Now that is a very low income person. Um, not everyone I talked to, of course, was, was that poor, if we can use that word, but that's an example. There's other stuff going on that is also striking. I haven't said much yet about wealth. The wealth disparities in this country generally are enormous across the whole corporate, uh, the whole uh, company. <laughs> why, why do I want to say that? Across the whole country, uh, wealth is held disproportionately by a very small fraction of, of folks. 40% held by roughly by the top 1% of wealth holders, 1 or 2% by the bottom 40 or 50% of wealth holders. Wow, that's not, and wealth is, this is not like, are, are you wealthy? No, it's like, do you have anything in your savings so that if things go wrong, you can buffer or maybe you can put a down payment on a house or go to school or save for whatever. So that's a problem. And then the last statistic I will cite is that all of this would be less distressing if it were a transitory phenomenon for the families that I'm talking about. But this last bullet is about mobility. That is the ability to move from low income and low wealth to something better. And in this country, again, great research that tracks family by family the likelihood of leaving low income and, and low wealth is small. If you're lucky, you might go from the bottom 20% to the second from the bottom 20%, but that's, you have to be lucky to have that. Going up to the top, that just doesn't really happen. Going up to the upper 40% the upper doesn't really happen. So this is not uh, a transitory phenomenon. It's a lifelong phenomenon for these folks. This is just to say when I add up the losses inherent in the current system, that's not a small number. <laughs> Deaths. Uh, uh, childhood poverty costs, all of the things listed here. I put land theft from indigenous people because it's not always accounted for. We actually took about what's currently valued today, about $40 trillion of land from indigenous people. That's kind of a lot. Um, 15 to $17 trillion each and every year of loss entailed in the current system. So if you're an economist like me, that's a lot of economic loss, lost opportunity. If you're a humanitarian like many of us in this room, that's an incredible amount of human loss. That's what's lost each year under the current system. I don't have time to talk about this so much because I know we want to keep, keep on time and get to some questions. But I just want to say if you read the book, it's careful to go through the history that traces how the narratives I've described have been used explicitly to make decisions to shape the economy for government policy, for the private sector, for macroeconomic policy, <laughs> what I was involved in earlier. We, we did some stuff during the great, the great the financial crisis and Great Recession of 2007-8-9 that made it clear what our priorities were as a nation, by which I mean we saved the financial system quickly. They move more rapidly, so there's some sense to that. But within months, the financial system was doing well. It was years and years and years and years until uh, unemployment recovered, and during that time, we lost people who were innocent bystanders in the crisis lost their homes. Why? Uh, it's hard to save them. Uh, there's moral hazard problems, we say, right? That, which means they're going to abuse the system. So anyway, I'm not going to go through all this. You've seen it, I hope, before. Institutional racism, ra redlining, covenants, uh, the slants in the, the New Deal, which was our very successful government-sponsored wealth-building program in the 1930s and 40s and afterwards, really successful, which built wealth via the government for a subset of the population, <laughs> right? And you know which subset that is. Um, anyway, this is just, again, I don't have time to go through all of this. Maybe I'll keep that quote. This is about the way in which we have a, reached an agreement, a norm in the private sector about the relationship between employers and employees. And it's partly about unions, but not only that. 
It is interesting to read the history of the employer-employee contract in the 1910, 20s, 30s, 40s in the United States. Very different from what it is today. In some cases, that was because the employers genuinely cared about their employees. That's great. But in large part, too, it was because unions were much larger. Now, I doubt we're going back to a fully unionized or much more unionized economy. But the importance of the union here was that it was, as I said, a counterbalance to uh, the, the power of capitalists, the owners of the, the businesses, the employers. It was a counterbalance that meant that employers had to think about whether they were offering their employees a reasonable employment contract that featured reasonable wages, reasonable schedules, reasonable benefits, and so on. And be, be, because either the presence or the threat of uh, the, the uh, unions coming into the sector, because of that, they changed the way they, they, uh, they interacted with their employees, the, way, the arrangement they had with their employees. This quote, so in around 1980, it's not a precise date, we as a country, and the government helped in this, and the private sector was complicit, essentially dismantled unions. This is a statement from President Reagan, who many people love. That's fine with me, but this is what he said. What he says is that it's the private sector that offers the most creative, the least expensive, and the most efficient solutions to our social problems. That's what he said. So I think two things about that. One is, as an economist, there is no real incentive for the private sector at large to solve social problems. What's the return to them in doing so? There, there isn't. I mean, they, they can't solve institutional racism. They, they have no incentive to do so. But equally important, the second thing is, so this, this, was made for, this statement was made 42 years ago. What has the private sector done to solve these problems in the last 42 years? And the answer is, there's a few good companies out there, which is terrific. I am so happy to see it, and probably even more small businesses. They have not come close to solving or even thinking about solving those problems. That view of the world that says, there's another quote where he says, uh, the, the unions that we're trying to bust are inconsistent with our emerging free, cap free market capitalist view of the US. That's what he said. That's the narrative, right? They're, they, we can't have unions. They're inconsistent with our view of free market capitalism. That's unfortunate, because they're not inconsistent. They can be a part of it. And my argument throughout the book is not that we dismantle or, or, or abandon capitalism. I actually think capitalism can work, but it depends on how you design and structure it. And OK, so that's some of the history. As I said, the balance of power has shifted. So these are just some solutions that I propose. We don't have enough time to talk about them all. Um, but what are these things? These are all investments. They are almost all investments in the human capital and then the financial capital, which uh, our citizens deserve to have. So early childhood education. To me, a no-brainer. Is it expensive? Yeah, it costs more than $20,000 per child per year to provide high-quality early childhood education. Great. Can we afford that? Well, I say we can't afford not to do it. Why? Because the returns to investing 20 or $22,000 a year are roughly six times that. So for every dollar you spend, six times that comes back in terms of higher earnings, better health care outcomes, lower incidence of uh, in interaction with the prison system, and so on. Very well documented, because there are systems, there are pilots like this, where they provide early childhood education, and they've tracked the adults now to the age of 50-some and beyond. They've been around for a long time. That's one. Better use of community colleges. They can provide a terrific pathway to stable employment. They're chronically underfunded. A lot of them are you know, well run, but not enough money. That's, that's a, a focal point. We, I talked about some changes that might be nice to see in the workforce, including wages. So if, if you're being paid $12 an hour less in many states, uh, if you're the sole earner, you can't survive. If there's two of you, 24,000, then you're earning 48,000 bucks a year. As I said, there's no place in the country where if you have a kid or two, there's no place in the country you can survive on that. So we need to move wages up. The profits are there to pay for that, right? That's a, that would be a shift, uh, not for small businesses, but for large corporations, the profits actually are there to pay for wage increases. But So you're going to ask a question later. That would be great. Um, housing is, is important. I talk a little bit about that. And then the most controversial, wealth equalizing policies, where if we wait for improvements in education and income and economic stability to build wealth, that will probably work 
after about 75 years. That's the estimate of how long it takes. It's just it takes time. Wealth is almost always accumulated generationally. It takes time. Okay. So th this is just the closing slide, which is a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968. The reason I put that quote up there is because it's incredibly prescient. It, it identifies, if this is not the I have a dream speech, most people love that because that's about all of us getting along, which of course, how, how, how could you not love it? But this is about what, what Martin Luther King Jr. felt was operating in our economy up until 1968, 55 years ago. And what he points out is that systematically, the government supported, in this case, agricultural workers by giving them land, by giving them technical training, by giving them low-cost loans to mechanize their farms, by giving them all sorts of other support. And as he says, those are the very people today telling the black man that he should pull himself up by his bootstraps. They weren't bootstrapping themselves. They were heavily government supported. And that is true through the New Deal for not all, but many white families. The lingering effects of that positive today, the lingering effects of denial of opportunity, of course, lingering today as well. So that's the quote from Martin Luther King. What's unfortunate in my view is that 55 years later, it's still true. It's still true that that's the way the US economy is working. Great for a lot of folks, but denying opportunity to loads and loads and loads of people. So that's that. Do you want to, do we have time for questions or? We do. So yeah, so that's, that's, the, that's what's in the book. There is so much more in there. It is not something that I've made up. I'm talking to you now, trust me, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of footnotes in this book that document exactly where the facts for this come from. And when I say there's profits, that's from the official statistics on profits, mostly for large corporations. That's who I'm talking about here. That's not made up. All that stuff is documented, the history documented. What to do about it is, of course, open for debate. I'll pick it off with a question. Sure. It's been there since the beginning. You know, I think it's important to say that it, it's not that we are in the same state that we were in the colonial area or the Gilded Age of the late 19th century, although in terms of wealth, we're, we're close to that. Um, so we have made some progress over our nation's history. But over the last 40 or 50 years, not so much progress on income inequality. That's been with us for quite some time. So that's an enduring problem. And in terms of wealth, the best data only get put back to the 1980s. But that, the, the ratio of, let's say, uh, median net worth for white families to median net worth for black and Hispanic families has been roughly the same, about seven to one throughout that entire period. So no obvious uh, trend in that data. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a question over here? Yes, so um, when you think about the labor market and not predicting you know, a very large rise in union support and so forth, there is you know, very large strikes right now that are really catching attention of yep. business owners who are not young unionized workers. It's kind of a wake up call and you think about the demographics and how COVID <coughs> pulled forward a lot of retirements. Don't you believe there's an optimism to be thought that the sh there is a shift to the power, I think, to employees over, um, now it probably applies more to people with certain skill sets. But, yep. you know, can you comment on, you know, we don't need to necessarily have to have a rise in union yeah. membership to, to, to have a, a, a historical change. You study history. It seems to me there's a change happening as far as, you know, a little bit of balance of power in the bargaining table going towards employees. So, yeah, and I, so I, I think there is some hope there. I think um, there's more attention to it because of those, those uh, union actions that are well publicized. And I think employers are looking at that and thinking, is that something I'm gonna to need to respond to? And I think what I hope is true is that they will look at that and say, maybe there are some things I can do for my employee base. Where I do have the profit margin to, um, have to absorb some of those costs, maybe it's time to make a change. That would be great. I would say, you know, historically, typically those, there are, of course, exceptions to this. It's a big 
economy, we've lost economy. But historically, they've made moves when they had to, when there really was some power on the other side. So where labor is not organizing, I'm not, I'm not like, a, I'm not starting up unions, it's not my job, but I'm, a, I'm observing that there is something to this power balance that really does matter. So where workers are not organized, it may be harder to get employers to respond. And of course, in some cases, it is difficult for employers to respond. There, there are pinch. if you run a supermarket, for example, the margins are small, and how much you can pay your workers is an interesting question. It's not, that's not easy. There are others where margins are significant, as, as evidenced by the, the significant profits there. So, yeah, I think there's some hopeful signs. It's getting more attention. I don't know if what we really require some, is some more organized labor to offset employers, or they can see that this trend is evolving and they're going to respond to it because it's the right thing to do, or they feel that maybe there'll be some pressure down the line. I don't know. Um, I know that when it's organized, it seems to make a difference. When it's not, it, it might, it could. Other questions? Yep. What role does your former employer play in the uh, results that you <laughs> described here? Um, well, I mean, their primary job is to keep inflation low and stable, which they're working on right now. It's coming down, that's great. But part of the job, too, is to keep unemployment as low as is sustainable, and it, which is kind of where it is today. I mean, it was, it was around 3.9% until just a couple of months ago, it went up to 3.9%. It's still in the low, low range. I suppose that's a success. Um, I, I do suggest in the book that the, in the Great Recession financial crisis episode I alluded to earlier, <coughs> that they and the administration, which was a democratic administration after a few months, this is an equal opportunity offender, um, they slanted their policies towards helping financial institutions and some wealthy folks, less so for the average household in the United States. Not because they were mean, but because they really, they worried about these, they called them moral hazard effects. Folks would take advantage of the programs and, and they wouldn't have the effect that they wanted. So that certainly during that episode, and then chronically, I think because of a, a, an economic spat that has swept the globe, um, they, they worried maybe more about inflation than they had to. And the reason I say that is starting in the mid-1990s, going to just until the pandemic when inflation took off, they couldn't get inflation as high as they said that they wanted it to be, that is they couldn't get it up to 2%. And yet during that time, the average unemployment was well above what's sustainable. So it seems like they, they, I argued at the time, and I argue now, they had the leeway to be more stimulative and keep the economy <coughs> growing without causing any inflation or getting inflation up a little to its target level. And so there's probably, I, I would argue, between the Fed and the administration, there's a bias in, in terms of controlling inflation but worrying a little bit less about unemployment. That's more debatable, but that's, that's the role I would say to play. You had a question? Not so much a question <coughs> as a statement. Oh, okay. I agree that it is systemic. I disagree with your whole thing about, the Google, about people pulling themselves up. Mm -hmm. I was a teacher in Prince George's County, Maryland, which is one of the highest, if you're familiar with it. I used to live in DC, I know Prince George's County. Okay, so you know uh, PG, Prince George's County, commonly called PG, is one of the poorest counties in the United States. Yep. When I got there at the high school, I was a high school physics teacher. When I got there, the graduation rate, as you know, back in the 80s was 19%, which is, I can't but say abysmal. Abysmal. Yeah, right. yeah, abysmal. When I left, it was 83% because of the fact the program that I put in your quest for more. 83% of the kids who I worked with graduated college. These are kids whose parents didn't graduate high school. Right because they got involved with taking ownership. So I think that there are plenty of programs out there. We just need to redesign our education system. Our education system, and you hit on it, is agrarian. Yeah, it's and yeah. That's why the kids wake up at seven o'clock in the morning. That's why it's off during the summer. Right. It's not like that in other countries. Right. Our economy is not agrarian based anymore. Our education system has to be completely overhauled 
because we're teaching people to be employees, not to be owners of business, not to be professionals, not to be courageous, not to take ownership of their lives. So what we need to do is, yes, you're right, it is systemic, but we need to put in a new system in the education department to change this so that America can be the country, the leadership that it once was, because we're falling behind. So it sounds like we agree, actually. Um, I, I am saying it's systemic, and I am arguing for changes. I focus first on early childhood only because when they get to the Prince George's <laughs> County High Schools, if their early childhood experience is poor, they have a lot of making up still to do, and you experience that firsthand. Well, and what you describe is putting the kind of attention on secondary school education that gives kids a chance to succeed. There, they actually have opportunity, and by doing that, you achieve success. How could I disagree? Um, that that practice that Prince George's County put in place is not common across lower income communities in the United States. So changing that, I agree, would make a huge difference. I would, I would love to see it start at birth with all the early childhood education in the region. I think we'll work with kids that young. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah. <laughs> that take, it take, takes a special skill. Although I, I, it takes special skills to work with high school students, I know, uh, having taught in high school just you know, ad hoc from time to time. Um, so I agree with that. That's about focus, devoting resources and care, and structuring the educational system so that it really does provide the opportunity to succeed. I think. The country still, not uniformly, but in general, does breed in our citizens a sense of innovation, possibility, and entrepreneurship, if you will, broadly construed. Not everybody should be a business owner, but whatever, <laughs> more broadly. Which is not like what you see in every country around the world. We tend to think a little more, I don't know where this comes from, it's part of our national DNA, but I think it's a good thing. We tend to be more creative and innovative than, than on average, lots of innovative people on average than many other countries around the world. So harnessing that, letting far more people exercise their innovation and creativity, creativity within the economy is, is the goal, so that's kind of our thing. So I, I'm with you on that, that's, that, that, that wasn't a hard question. Yeah, last question. Hi, are there any policies that you have seen municipalities adopt as a way of correcting some of these myths or moving forward? Yes, uh, so which one should I talk about, the most controversial one or the least controversial <laughs> one? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> so I'll start, the most controversial one is reparations. So uh, as I say in the book, I've talked about reparations before because I, I think we need to have a conversation about it. We clearly did something that has had a profound and lasting influence on subsectors of our population, black African Americans and then through other kinds of discrimination, lots of other problems. We did that. Is it over now? Is it not over? You, when you look at the well statistics and study the history, you just can't say that the effects of that have now just taper down. It's not true. Okay, is that an easy topic? No. The amounts involved are huge. The wealth gap for just for African Americans today is $14.5 trillion compared to comparable white households. Well, that's, that's a huge amount. We don't, we don't have that sitting in our pockets at the moment. We need to begin the conversation. So Evanston, Illinois, began the conversation and said, okay, we recognize that they're a relatively well-off suburb of, of Chicago. Um, what did they do? Well, let's think about the main channel through which this discrimination operated in Evanston, and it was housing. And so they said, okay, so let's identify folks who have suffered, who are descendants of, of slaves, and let's dedicate some municipal money to provide housing assistance to get some of these folks into housing where they couldn't otherwise. And they're in the middle of doing that. They just started the program. They made the first few awards that's in the last year or so. Was that easy? Was that easy? Yes. Uh, was that difficult? Yes. Um, did they have long debates? Yes. They're a fairly, I'd say, you know, progressive, I don't want to make that a bad word, but kind of progressive uh, town. They tried. They had the discussion to begin with. There's a book by Sandy Darity that talks about reparations. He's been thinking about it for decades. And it is, it is, of course, an incredibly complicated thing to think about pursuing. So that's why he wrote a book which goes into detail about what would you need to do to even start doing this. And of course, the first thing is we need to discuss it, study it, and come up with a plan that might actually be actionable over the next generation. Um, in, in the book, I say, there are other ways to, to transfer wealth. 
But if, you, if we ever came to consider reparations seriously, we couldn't possibly pay 15 or $30 trillion in a single year, so it's not feasible. We could pay some of that each year for the next 25 years. If that were a guarantee from the government that families who have been denied access opportunity were to get those resources, that's an asset that you could use essentially today, even though you get some of the proceeds with government guarantee down the line. That might take care of the payment, and it makes the, act, the asset more immediately available to families who don't have wealth at the moment. But uh, that's the most controversial. The easiest one is, as I saw these early childhood programs. Yeah, they're early childhood programs in operation and have been for more than 45 years. They've been intensively studied, um, many by a Nobel Prize winning economist, if that means something to you, is, is another is a smart person, who is not a liberal progressive sort of guy. He's a guy who thinks that early childhood education investments might work, and when he studied them, they really do. So that's the, that's the first one I would point to. And there, there's success in those, those pilot programs in a few places around the country. Yeah, thank you so much. For sure. This. Very thought-provoking uh, uh, talk today, so thank you all for coming. Thank you again, Unitil, for um, sponsoring today's event. It's always great, and thank you to Concord TV for... Um, for being here and, and making sure that we can get this out to folks that could not be here today. And uh, I hope you all have a great day and we'll see you uh, at an upcoming chamber event.